For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Lum Gilengonfe. Joining me in studio is author Mahokhodi Oampela Magen, here to discuss her book, Innards. Mahokhodi, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Lum Gileng. The book is a collection of short stories depicting the quirks and nuances of characters and their lives in Soweto. Can you take us through the creative process that went into developing the collection of stories? Sure. Um, that's such a beautiful place to begin because the creative process has so much to do with my lived experience. Uh, I am South African. I was born in Soweto in Paragwanath. And I would say the creative process really began at birth, which is an unusual thing to say, but I think for a first book it makes a lot of sense. So much deep lived experience and intergenerational experience weaves its way into this book and is married with the diligence of craft. I studied writing, so applying myself and my love of language was really important, but then marrying that with this thing of like, I know what it feels like to be inside of Soweto and to be in many different kinds of Soweto. I mean, we know that blackness, for example, is not a monolith. And certainly in Soweto, at least the one that I grew up with, you know, we had really wealthy people, we had middle class people, we had really struggling families as well. And my job was to weave all of that orchestra of different voices into something that felt like, hey, this is alive and this feels like it has texture, right? Which is where that lived experience is really important. But research is extremely important to me too. And I'm talking about hitting the bookshelves, becoming a nerd, which is my happy place, um, but also museums, also archives, and getting really diligent and curious about things that I know and have had handed down to me. For example, we all grew up with a story of 1976. I wasn't personally there, but I feel as though growing up in this country, at least when I was growing up, it was just part of the water, something we understood as our inheritance. And yet, hitting the archives, I discovered so many new things that were fresh layers. And I tried to bring the relevant pieces to the characters that were dealing and grappling with parts of either 1976 or moving all the way further to 1948 and then way into the future because this is a work of fiction it's like speculative too it gets into a little bit of everything mm. what is the significance of the book title oh oh gosh you're going for the jugular veins <laughs> um in its Innards has so many different layers of meaning, right? When you think about innards, you think about what's on the inside of you, your private inner life, right? And that's so much of what I wanted to capture. I think for me, one of the challenges in the literary canon, because when we talk about the literary canon, unfortunately, we're often centering Western writing and Western canon. When people like myself, like you, show up on the page, our inner lives are often stripped and not fully imagined the way that I have experienced them in life. And so for me, I really wanted to get into the richness of how we be, if you will, how we think, um, who we are in our private moments, who we are outside of the white gaze. It's a really important theme throughout the book. But then in it is also the inner guts of animals. It's awful. It's the thing that is sold and consumed and it's a delicacy. Um, I was in Italy and wow, I was just so taken by what they do with this thing that we think of as poor people's food, right? I grew up with my grandfather running around Deep Kloof Soweto on his bicycle, this rickety old thing. And he sold innards awful mala lemogodu on his rusty old bicycle that felt like it was from who knows world war ii or world war one or before and that really rich imagery of the insides of animals becoming the insides of our souls because you consume them then they become part of you and it taps into this thing that is our inner imagination i was like wait a minute we're playing with many different levels here i like this i like this you examine identity through the everyday lives of soweto residents during apartheid and beyond 
Can you outline some of the social challenges endured by the characters? Where to begin? <laughs> Where to begin? The, the um, book begins before 1948. So 1948 is the official beginning of apartheid. But as you and I really well know, apartheid and white supremacy, this project, has been alive on this continent and this part of our world for more than 400 years, right? That's four centuries. So the kinds of challenges that you're describing I actually think that they're challenges that are familiar to most people of African descent throughout the world. Grappling with your identity, feeling like you are on the outside of your very own homeland, right? Feeling like you've been displaced and not just feeling like you've been displaced, but actually having been displaced here in South Africa internally through the land distribution that apartheid did, right? I'm talking about the beginning of the 20th century. And the very first story that you are brought into Enids explores this through the narrative of a house in Soweto, one of the very first houses that goes up in the 50s. And you see this family that's been displaced because the place where they were was now been taken over by white people who were given the land to farm or to do with what they will. Now where do they go? They are taken on cattle lorries and they are transported to Soweto, to this place that is actually, uh, historically, we're talking about something that was a wasteland, right? This was where the municipality took all of the waste from the entire city. And I wanted to start there to give the sense of home and what it means to take a place that's completely barren a place that is for those who are entirely displaced. We're dealing with so much displacement right now in our lives, both here in South Africa, but all over the world. There's a lot that's happening. And for me, I wanted to explore that theme, but in a way that brings people into the smallness of hearth, into the smallness of the domestic life and what it means when you remake yourself, and you remake home in a place that is hostile, essentially. In what ways are the sensibilities of the characters in the stories shaped by the apartheid system, if at all? In what ways are they shaped by apartheid? Yeah. <laughs> Name me the ways they aren't. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I took pains to be really thoughtful how I crafted these characters so that you understand these are folks who have been through some of the worst traumas. I mean, apartheid was described by the United Nations as a war against humankind, like a war against humanity itself. So that's that starting point is a given. I think most people who come into anything that's about South African literature, there's almost an assumption that we're going to tackle some things that have to do with this past that's pretty gnarly and ugly. And yet, I know us to be so much more than just our experience of trauma. I know us to be so alive, so alive, like nobody does vibe like we do. Nobody. You have to be here to experience it fully. Nobody is as funny as we are. Humor is central to especially the black South African experience. And it's an extremely important tool that helped us move through the trauma and to still make sense of what does it mean to live in a so-called post-apartheid South Africa where there's so much inequality, where there's so much want for a lot of people who were promised a different kind of freedom. So your question, <laughs> there is no character who is not deeply, deeply shaped, made different, remade, turned inside out, have their innards kind of spilling on the street from this shock of what apartheid did to our systems. At the same time, I am very proud of how all of these characters are bigger than apartheid this thing that tried to is destroy us. I think of Lucille Clifton and her beautiful poem, Between Stars Shine and Clay. 
the very end she talks about i'm gonna butcher it it's not a perfect quote but you know every single day something tried to kill me and here i am i'm still standing the book displays the triumph and depth of the human spirit amid raging adversity are these stories intended to inform the ways in which we ought to remember and imagine Soweto and its people? <laughs> um, I'm not prescriptive enough to tell people how to hold the memories that they have of Soweto um, during apartheid. And definitely I shy away from being prescriptive and telling people here's how you should read the book, right? I mean, I hope that the work is rich and deep enough to be the kind of art that is complex and challenges you again and again if you come to it more than once and maybe offers you different ways of seeing things. So if we become prescriptive, it's tough because then we take away the multifacetedness of what an experience can be. And then there's also the thing of how we hold, how we hold our history, how we hold memory. That is such deeply important work. It's extremely charged. I mean, I think, for example, about this country and where we are as a country and how we understand our own history and how much, especially the recent history of the 20th century and this apartheid, a little bit of post-apartheid life in South Africa, there's definitely a project that is a political project of shaping what we believe the full narrative is and what the official narrative is. I think that's dangerous work because it robs all of us of our agency and how much we each played a role, many different kinds. I mean, such a wide diversity of how different people contributed to the anti-apartheid cause. And for me, the danger of a single narrative or an official narrative or a politically expedient narrative that serves a player or specific players is it takes away from all of us in recognizing, wait a minute, we had something to do with this, each one of us. We were the architects of seeing this thing fall. Not only were we the architects, but we also have to hang on to the memories as they are true for us, like an individual fingerprint. It's not all one and the same. We didn't have like one monolithic black anti-apartheid experience. I mean, you see that for sure in, in the book. You have some people who were traitors. You have some people who were the most brave kind of activist, but they didn't win awards and they didn't become some big title person that you might know about. And for me, that tapestry is really important, maintaining that. The book mentions the Black Lives Matter movement, mm. the war in Ukraine, and the Nganla debacle. How do the characters in the stories interpret contemporary social <laughs> issues? Wow. Um, you know, I'm so interested in the inner lives right? Not a mistake, the inner lives of my characters and what animates them and the worlds that they live in. So, of course, they're going to be touched by the Black Lives Movement. And I am also very clear that we are, we're all over this world. We're not just the thing that apartheid wanted to do by prescribing us in a very specific location, be it the homelands, Umzulu, this is where you stay, Umotswana, this is where you stay, or you belong to this prescription of Johannesburg, you cannot move beyond. After apartheid, the explosion of what the world has become to us, that I go all over the world and I'm so delighted to see me reflected back wherever I am. I meet South Africans. Just recently, I was in Tokyo, I was walking somewhere, and I could not believe because it's, you know, Tokyo is a very quiet kind of place in, in like it's still, and it's a beautiful kind of stillness, but I just hear this noise behind me. And I'm like, yo, these people are loud, and I bet you they're African, and I bet you they're Nigerian. And I just keep minding my business. I cross the street and I keep going. As I'm crossing the street, these people get closer and closer 
and louder and louder. And I turn around and I'm like, why do I understand them? Zulu. These people are my people. I was so delighted to see them, number one. But then number two, um, I mean, imagine that. Like, imagine that. In 1986, during the states of emergencies, to imagine young, beautiful, professional black people in Tokyo, just there, by the way, invited to do their thing. That was like, you're talking about outer space like Mars. That was like science fiction, but it is our reality. And so if I were writing about those particular characters on the street in Tokyo, of course, I would have to be concerned about what is happening in Tokyo around the age. You know, I know they have a demographic thing in the country that's very sharp. So much of their generation is aging and how are they going to sustain both the economy but also the culture? How are they going to keep that going with such an aging population? How would a young South African, one of these people that I met on the street, how would they interact with that? You know, in their loud Zuluness, shouting, estratene, like what would they do with that? When I think about the questions you're asking, Nkandla, or any of the other ones. I mean, these, this, this is our bread and butter. This affects us at a level of bone and marrow. Of course, I have to be interested in how it rubs up with my characters. Of course, Ukraine, those characters have something to say, to think, you know? Um, and of course, it's also in dialogue with larger themes in the book that are about selfhood, that are about determination, that are about autonomy and who gets to tell our stories and who gets to tell us this is what you think this is who you are what your identity is in considering the polarizing statements attributed to life in the townships how necessary is it for readers to sit through dark and uncompromising portrayals of our humanity i think it's as necessary as what the truth demands you know i think i understand what you're talking about and i can zoom out a little bit and say you know, I'm based in the States. I come here quite a lot, so I consider myself moving between two places that I am based between two. One of the things that's true is in the West, there's a very, 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 I mean, <laughs> highlighter, please, um, problematic portrayal. Again, a very dangerous and singular narrative on what the African continent is. And it is what you're describing of how you describe the townships and Soweto and the like as carving as like the harbinger of darkness and that nothing good is almost ever reported about these places. So at the global level, it's the continent. At the hyperlocal level, what you're describing is our townships, places like Soweto. You know, I think it's, it's, it's important to hold two things at once. And I'm going to use a novel that you may be familiar with, We Need New Names, by No Violet Bulawayo. You know, when her book came out, a lot of Africans, global diaspora, had things to say exactly to kind of picking up on the texture of what you're saying, that this book is important, but why must African stories always go to these deep, dark places? And she's, she's writing about the aftermath of Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe and these young, very tender, very impressionable kids, um, Bosbu, um, Bodaling, in a township actually, in, in um, Zim. And the critique was, this is a little bit too much pandering to this kind of po uh, poverty porn that the West loves, right? And not enough portraying the fullness of who we are outside of that. And I think a lot of the criticism was coming from folks who may be from different classes, right? So you didn't necessarily have that experience yourself firsthand, what it's like to grow up in that specific township. And here's what I think is really important to hang on to. You can do whatever you want, but here's where I come down. Two things are true at the same time. The West has a deeply problematic way in how it portrays us and it's colored by white supremacy the thing that you're saying about the media and how is soweto portrayed how are our townships portrayed 
product of white supremacy, product of apartheid, and the ongoing legacy of racism in our society. It colors everything. So it's not a surprise or a wonder like, oh my God, how is this happening? That the media has a bias when it's covering us. At the same time, there are things that are happening that deserve a spotlight. And the reason why I brought in No Violet's book is because of, number one, that book is brilliant, okay? <laughs> Bar none, the book is brilliant. It's gorgeous. The language is rich. The depictions of the characters are full. And she brings you into a world that's whole. That's really important. She's not reducing everything to, yay, the worst happened to us and now we must just lie down and let me tell you about like how terrible it is. It's not that. It's more these and these are true. Both of these things are true at the same time. I mean, if you're writing about that Zimbabwe, right as things are going through the roof in terms of inflation and all the crazy, right? If you don't talk about what's challenging to people in their everyday lives, then which Zimbabwe are you writing about? If I'm writing about Soweto during apartheid and I don't bring you into the truth of what the hardness of those experiences for the characters were, then I mean, I lived in Soweto, which Soweto are you talking about? But at the same time, like don't reduce. So these and these things can be true at the same time. Don't do the white supremacist thing of like, zoom in, oh my God, poor child, born a belly, like distended, and everybody is just helter-skelter, ma's crying, dad is absent. It's just a total like show. That's not true. That's, that's, also, that's just not true. That's not my lived experience. I'm sure it's not yours. We're whole people. Show the wholeness. Show how tender we are to each other show how we we were the thing that kept each other going we didn't have a safety net we didn't have ambulances that came do you know like you dial you're busy hey hey from Kwazile, something's wrong this person's bleeding they're just like okay good luck but that person would be taken care of because of what our community is like write about that part too you know like if you're going to show the blood also show the care that went into taking care of this person show the doctor who lived like two streets up who was black like me show them too you know like make it the whole story not just the yo is bad <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much that was author Mahuhodi or Ampela Makene discussing a book in its